<laughs> he's, he's worked out. <laughs> okay, so um, welcome. Um, I do want to extend a warm welcome to all of you who are here this evening uh, for this special and important debate on Brexit. Uh, <laughs> I joke, I joke, I joke. Um, we're all here uh, to talk about something of far greater significance. Uh, my name is uh, Ashley Charles and I'm a member of this church, Selhurst Evangelical Church. Uh, and as a member of this church, I would first like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who has come here and extend thanks to both James and Adnan for all the uh, effort that they've put into behind the scenes to make this happen. Uh, this evening we've come together to do what many struggle to do in public discourse and politics in these days. We've come to debate. That is to argue one position against another, but to do so with respect for one another. Both James and Adnan I would consider to be the best respective representatives of both Christian and Muslim apologetics. And so it would be both a privilege and an educational opportunity to not only see these two men contend for their respective positions, but to also do so in a manner that can be modelled for all of us here this evening. Now before we begin, I'm going to give you some uh, venue information. So uh, if you need to use the toilet, uh, there's one in the, in the welcome area and there's some further toilets back in the, uh, the, the hall behind the welcome area. Um, and in the event of a fire, uh, please go out the way you came in, uh, but if there's a fire in, over there, uh, then there's another uh, fire set at the back. Uh, so with all that being said, let's get started. The subject of the debate is who resembles Jesus, Christians or Muslims? The format of the debate is as follows. We will be having 20 minutes opening statements, 10 minute rebuttals, then five minutes of crossfire between both James and Adnan, and then five minutes of peace for conclusions. Then after that, we're gonna have a little bit of time uh, for Q&A uh, from, from the audience. Uh, depending on, on how things go, um, we'll, we'll see how much time we've got left at the end. Uh, and so with that, I'm not sure who won the coin toss. I oh, none. So I'd like to... Uh, uh, no coin toss, okay. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, invite Adnan uh, to, to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all for attending this important discussion. This discussion is important because we will proceed in the spirit of love and compassion. There is a lot of hate and misunderstanding out there, which we both... Uh, um, disagree with and the point of this discussion, this dialogue, this debate today is to show the world that Christians and Muslims can come together as brothers in humanity and discuss the differences in a perfectly civilized setting and go home in one piece. I always like to give presence to Dr. James White. I have a special uh, uh, respect for him and um, the, the, the gift I have for him today is a very a special one indeed, not that the others were, others were not special. Um, this is a coin from the first century of Islam. Uh, it is dated, it is an Umayyad dirham from the year 97 of Islam, 97 AH, when some of the companions of the Prophet of Islam were alive. It has an entire chapter of the Quran inscribed on the coin and we see a lot of Christian friends out there claiming that uh, Muslims do not have any evidence from the first century of the Quran some people do unfortunately so I'm giving this to a Christian scholar so that he can in the future confirm that I have something from the first century of Islam with Quran on it so a present for James with love and respect So we can start with my time now. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the merciful, the beneficent. The topic today is who resembles Jesus, Muslims or Christians? What do we mean by resemble? 
One can resemble someone in uh, uh, physical looks or in beliefs, in behavior. So we will be looking at all these things today. Do the Christians actually resemble Jesus? When I say Christians, I mean Christians who are alive today, who believe in the Trinity, who have certain ideas about Jesus Christ. Likewise, we will see that Muslims uh, who walk the planet today, uh, who claim to believe in Jesus, is their belief actually true? Do they actually resemble and follow Jesus Christ in all the things I mentioned? So, re re resemblance in what? Resemblance in worship, for example. Do Muslims resemble Jesus in worship? Uh, do Muslims resemble Jesus in beliefs? Do the Christians uh, resemble Jesus in both these things is the discussion today. To proceed, what did Jesus call God is a very important question. What was the word Jesus used, among other words, in the Gospels? One of the words he used, allegedly we are told that when he was on the cross, he cried or he, he, he exclaimed, Ilahi, Ilahi lama sabachthani which is actually Aramaic. If that is Jesus who is speaking on the cross, then he is using a word which the Muslims use for God today, which is Ilaha. Ilaha and Ilahi are exactly the same words used in two different languages. Aramaic and Arabic are sister languages. So the word Ilaha is the same word Muslims use for God. So our proclamation to accept Islam or to proclaim Islam uh, uh, for that matter, is what? La ilaha illallah. There is no God except Allah, except God Almighty Allah. So ilaha, ilahi, Allah, all stem from the same root word, ilaha. So Jesus used this very term uh, according to the gospel records. Of course, we don't agree that Jesus was put on the cross. We don't believe that. It, was, um, it could be someone else, and that's another discussion we can have at another point. I had a debate with uh, Samuel Green not very long ago. If you want to see our view on the crucifixion, you must go and watch that debate, uh, myself and Samuel Green. Greeting. Jesus greeted his companions just like the Muslims do, or vice versa. How did Jesus greet his companions? According to John 20.10, Jesus said to his companions, Peace be upon you. How do the Muslims greet each other today? Uh, obviously taught by Prophet Muhammad, who himself claimed to be a brother of Jesus in faith. So the greeting is, Assalamu alaikum in the Arabic language. Uh, if we translated that into the Hebrew language, it would be Shalomu alaikum, which is what Jesus said to his companions, or possibly some uh, uh, version of that in Aramaic. So Jesus and Muslims are exactly the same in that regard. When we greet each other, we greet by saying, peace be upon you. The Christians do not, uh, do not do that today. Christians do not necessarily specifically use this mode of greeting each other. In that, Christians are not actually uh, like Jesus. They do not resemble Jesus in that. Prayer. How did Jesus actually pray? Not what he said in his prayer. And even what he said in prayer uh, doesn't actually contradict uh, the beliefs of Muslims. Uh, every single thing Jesus said in prayer, actually uh, most of it, what the gospel authors attribute to him, is in line with Islam. So how did he actually pray? We are told in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 39, that he actually prostrated. He went into the Garden of Gethsemane, he fell on his face, and he prayed to God. This is prostration. This is exactly how Muslims pray. And was Jesus inventing this? Was he just doing things randomly? Was this an accident? Did he just feel like falling on his face on the ground and praying like that? No. He was following prophets who came before him. As you can see the references on the screen. Joshua 5.14. We are told that Joshua fell on his face, prayed exactly the same way. Numbers, we are told Moses and Aaron... Uh, the book of Numbers 20, chapter 20, verse 6, we are told Moses and Aaron prayed in exactly the same way. Abraham, in the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verse 3, we are told he fell on his, his face and he prayed to God. Likewise, we have other... Uh, in fact, the book of Revelation tells us that this is how angels pray to God, bow, uh, bowing to God, falling on their faces. And Nehemiah and 1 Chronicles 21, 16 gives us the same idea as to how the Israelite prophets uh, or noblemen or priests prayed to God. They fell on their faces and they prayed to God. 
And this is exactly how Muslims pray today. Prophet Muhammad told the Muslims that this is how previous prophets prayed. Therefore, we pray like this. And this was based upon revelation, of course. We believe Muhammad, peace be upon him, received a revelation from God. Same God who sent revelations to Abraham, Moses and Jesus. And the Quran confirms the authenticity and the authority of these previous prophets. Yes, of course, the Quran also claims that their, messaged, their messages were changed, they were altered. Therefore, the necessity of the Quran, hence the Quran. So, Muslims pray exactly like Jesus did. And most Christians, and I say most, over 90% Christians in the world, uh, and I'm only leaving 10% to be safe. Um, over 90% Christians in the world do not pray like Jesus in this, when we study um, how he actually prayed. Uh, Jesus did not consume swine. He abhorred uh, pig meat. He actually did not do it. Why didn't he do it? Because he was a follower of the Mosaic law. He was a strict uh, observer of the Mosaic law. And we will see that how that is the case. Muslims do not uh, therefore consume pork or swine. Um, so in that, Muslims are very similar. They resemble Jesus and other prophets of the Old Testament. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. We are told in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 21, that he was circumcised on the day. Now, the Christians believe that Jesus was God even in the womb of Mary. Even when he was born, he was God um, because he had two natures. So when he was born of Mary, he had the divine nature and he had the human nature. So we are assuming now on the part of the Christians that Jesus is God. Right? When he was born. So if he's God, he's actually allowing himself to be circumcised. If he doesn't want his followers, the Christians, people who claim to follow him later on. By the way, when I say Christians claim to follow him, there is no insult uh, intended there. Rather, we have a view on Jesus, which is uh, independent of Christianity. And likewise, Christians have a view on Jesus, which we respect and appreciate. We do not agree with it, of course, and this is why we're having this discussion today. We do not agree with the Christian view of Jesus. We have a consistent, historically consistent view of Jesus, which is in line with Islamic theology. Therefore, we follow that particular view. So there is no insult or there is no hurt intended here. So please be clear on that. So Jesus, being God, allowed himself to be circumcised, knowing well that his alleged followers in the future will not be circumcising they won't be following him. So why be circumcised in the first place? But Muslims, believing in him as a prophet, as a messenger, follow him. In that regard, Muslims circumcise. Muslims follow the same tradition from the Old Testament. In that, Muslims are very similar uh, or they resemble Jesus Christ. Fasting, Jesus fasted for, for, for 40 days. Muslims also fast for 30 days and they are following a similar tradition. right? So in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 18, we are told that... Um, uh, Jesus was telling a story of uh, a Pharisee and a tax collector. The tax collector was humble, therefore he, was, he has a, a higher chance to be forgiven. And Pharisee has a lesser chance to be forgiven because he's arrogant. Uh, but a point Jesus raises is that he, uh, the, Pharisee said, the Pharisee said to God that I fast two days a week, therefore I am pious. And Jesus is using that as an example of piety, therefore he's endorsing it. And Muslims believe in fasting twice a week. Likewise, on Monday and on Thursday, as taught by the Prophet of Islam. So, uh, Jesus, using the example of the Pharisee, is not actually rebuking the very notion of fasting for two days. He's actually rebuking the arrogance of the Pharisee. Right? So, this distinction has to be made. So, Muslims fast like Jesus, or as he uh, encouraged others to fast for two days, uh, to be pious. Now, Muslims also re resemble Jesus in beliefs. Unlike the Christians. What do I mean by that? Jesus worshipped unipersonal God. When he was walking the earth, he worshipped a unipersonal God. Not only that, he confirmed the Jewish conception of God, which was unipersonal. Jesus was not a Trinitarian. Therefore, Muslims are not Trinitarians. Muslims follow and worship a unipersonal God. There are clear passages in the, in the New Testament uh, where Jesus 
is confirming the Jewish conception of God. How do I know this? The Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, when a Jewish man comes to Jesus Christ, asks him what is the first commandment or what is the most important commandment, Jesus tells him, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Right? That's the famous Shema. Um, so Jesus actually confirms the Jewish conception. Now if Jesus was a Trinitarian, he meant to be a Trinitarian or he was a believer in, in Trinitarian. This was the point where he should have taught the Jew, hold on a second, you have always worshipped a unipersonal God. Which Jesus actually confirms in the Gospel of John chapter 8 that you worship the Father. Okay, the Father glorifies me. The Father glorifies me of whom you the Jews say that he is your God. Not the Trinity, the Father, unipersonal God of the Jews. So here Jesus tells this Jewish man that, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Jew, the questioner, can only imagine one person, which is the Father. And then he turns around and he says, Master, you have spoken the truth. There is no one else beside him. So the Jewish man is speaking of the Father. Therefore, Jesus worshipped a unipersonal God. Not only that, he confirmed the Jewish unipersonal conception of divinity. He was not a Trinitarian. This was his chance to tell the Jewish man, you have worshipped a unipersonal God. There, now, there is a new covenant. I am the second person within the Trinity and there is another one, the third person, the Holy Spirit. He didn't do that. He actually, if he was a Trinitarian, deceived the Jewish man, which a prophet of God, let alone God, would never do. Muslims, therefore, believe in one God who is unipersonal, not a Trinity, not, not a trinity um, for that matter. So, in John 17, 3, Jesus goes further to confirm that Father is the only true God. In John 17, 3, this passage was a huge problem for church fathers writing in the, in the, in the, uh, in the third and the fourth century. They could not reconcile this verse with their binitarian or later trinitarian view. They could not reconcile, uh, in, in fact Jerome actually twisted the words of this particular uh, verse to suit his trinitarian view. And we can discuss that in Q&A if it's uh, brought up. So Muslims and Jesus are exactly the same in worshipping a unipersonal God. Jesus never said worship a trinity. I humbly challenge my friend my dear friend James White, Dr. James White, respectfully, to come here and tell us not believe in the Trinity and Muslims do not believe in the Trinity. And Muslims, in fact, the Quran actually directly uh, tells the Christian, Christians to not believe in the Trinity because it has nothing to do with Jesus. Jesus never taught it, he never preached it, he never worshipped it. Where did you get the Trinity from? It came up in the 4th century. It was finalized, finally, in the late 4th century. In the year 381 CE to be precise after the, the, the Council of Constantinople where three Cappadocian fathers had insisted uh, or by their works or by their insistence uh, the third person in the Trinity was added later on to the Creed of Nicaea which was established in 325 CE. So the Creed of Nicaea is essentially binitarian even as late as 325 CE. 50 years later in the year 381 the third person was added into the Trinity uh, into the binity and it became a trinity of the three persons. Muslims therefore do not follow the trinity because they do not believe it is something taught by the prophets, let alone God. So the commandments, Jesus taught certain commandments in the book of Matthew chapter 19 uh, verses 18 to 19. Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Also, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are told in Islamic literature, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught exactly the same principles as you can see on the screen in that hadith from Bukhari where the Prophet said, uh, swear allegiance to me for not joining anything in worship along with Allah, not to steal, not to commit illegal sexual intercourse, not to kill your children, not to accuse an innocent person, uh, not to be disobedient to do good deed. Very, very similar. They resemble each other as brothers. Jesus, when you look at him and when you look at Muhammad, they are brothers in one faith. They are teaching the same thing. Now we come to the question of the law. Jesus was a law-abiding Jew. He followed the Jewish law. In fact, in the book of Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 17, we are told that he upheld the law. 
Think not that I've come to abolish the law, rather I've come to fulfill it. In other words, the law made certain prophecies about him and he came to fulfill those prophecies. And anyone who teaches uh, others to go out of the law, even on a point, will be considered least king in the kingdom. of He is not from God. And Paul did exactly that, as we will see in due course later on. Right? Muslims uphold the law. Muslims follow the law which came from God. We believe the Quran was actually a confirmation of previous messages, previous laws. Quran came as a confirmation of the Torah and this message came for humanity, for the rest of the world. So in that Muslims are exactly the same as Jesus. Jesus was following a divine law, so do the Muslims. The Christians today do not follow the Mosaic law. They believe the law or the curse of the law was lifted by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus was crucified on the cross, therefore the curse of the law was lifted, right? And if that's the case, then either they are not following Jesus or they are following someone else, which is Paul, right? So Paul on the law, what Christians follow today was taught by Paul. Law is a curse. It cannot be followed. Therefore, it's a curse. So Paul is the real uh, prophet for Christians, not Jesus Christ. Because Paul went against a lot of the teachings Jesus had put forward to his followers. So it is Paul the Christians follow today. It is Paul who came up with this conception of the abolition of the law. And he was actually accused later on for doing so. And he denied. In the book of Acts, we are told... In chapter 21, how much time I have got left? Three minutes, thank you. I'm following your clock today. <laughs> okay, James. So, in the book of Acts, in chapter 21, we are told that Paul was confronted by the Jerusalem council. Who heads the Jerusalem council? It is James, a direct disciple of Jesus Christ. Not only a disciple, um, he was actually a brother of Jesus Christ. Now, how he was a brother is another question altogether. Theologians have grappled with this question for centuries. Was he a blood brother? Was he a cousin? But the, the, the New Testament calls James the brother or a brother of Jesus Christ. And he was the head of the Jerusalem church. He had more authority than Paul did because Paul is actually obeying the instructions of James. In chapter 15, the book of Acts, we are told that Paul comes to James to discuss the issue of the Gentiles coming to the way of the Christ. And now the question I have is, if Jesus has died and he has lifted the curse of the law, then why are the disciples in Jerusalem years after Jesus has died still following the law? Why are they still going to the temple and worshipping and following the law? And Paul was rightly accused by the Jewish followers of Jesus in Jerusalem for uh, abolishing the law. How do we know this? This is happening in the book of Acts chapter 21. Paul comes into the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish followers of Christ are angry with him. How dare you abolish the law? And then James tells Paul to go and practice the law in the temple so that people know that this is a lie. But it was not a lie. Paul had indeed taught the abolition of the law, as we can see in these verses on the screen there. Okay, Galatians 2.16, Romans 3.19-28, Galatians 3.10, Galatians 3.24-25. So Paul denied these accusations for some reason, and not only denied, he followed the instructions of James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, and he went to the temple and did the rituals according to the law. Now there are two options here for us. Either Paul is a hypocrite who says one thing to the Gentiles and says another to the Jews, which is what he did. According to his own words, he said, to a Jew I become a Jew, to, to a Gentile I become a Gentile. So Paul, in not so, so many words, is telling people that he was a hypocrite. Right? How do we know this? He even deceived James. He should have told James, hold on a second, you know Jesus has died. Jesus has lifted the curse of the law. Why do I have to go to the temple and do all these rituals? The law has been lifted. The curse has been lifted. You know that, James. You are a follower of Jesus. You believe in the same thing as, as I do. But they clearly did not believe in the same thing. They clearly did not. How much time do I have? 
Zero. Time is up. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will elaborate on this when I come back. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope I did not hurt anyone's feelings. The point here is to share our view on Jesus Christ. And you may disagree with it, but this is why we believe in Jesus in the way we believe in him. Thank you so much for listening. Well, before I start my time, let me also thank uh, very much um, Adnan Rashid for being here this evening. He stepped in. Uh, we, we had other plans and other arrangements that had been uh, made for a debate this evening, and those fell through. The gentleman I was going to be interacting with uh, was not able to do that. And then even after Adnan stepped in, then locations were problematic, and so I want to thank uh, the folks here. Uh, at Selhurst uh, Evangelical Church for opening their doors to us on very, 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 very short notice. Thank you for making the, the trip out here. Um, it is uh, sometimes difficult to put these things together while traveling. Uh, this is toward the end of a lengthy uh, trip uh, for, for me. I was in the Netherlands last weekend speaking on very different subjects than we're speaking on now. And so I'm thankful to everybody who has, especially Ashley, who has helped to make this come together and Adnan for stepping up and, uh, and doing this as well. Unfortunately, since it is toward the end of a, a lengthy trip, anything that I would have packed to give to someone other than Adnan to begin with uh, would be, have been destroyed uh, in, my, in my bag by now. And so unfortunately, even though I started this tradition, do you know when I started this tradition? Uh, I started this tradition with Shabir Ali in 2006. Uh, and, uh, but uh, sometimes when you're at the end of a very long trip, there's not much you could do about it. But We'll have to, we'll, we'll, we'll make up for it next time around with something that Adnan will really love, like maybe a football jersey or something like that. I don't know. That seems to be all the, all the rage right now. Uh, Messi, you want, 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 can, can, can you kick like him? Well, that was quite, a, quite the shot. That was, that was amazing. Uh, anyways, so with, uh, with that, let me be, uh, begin my, uh, my time. Thank you very much again for being here this evening. And this is an important topic, and it's not one I've ever heard debated before. And obviously, it can go a lot of different directions. Adnan just touched on uh, at least eight different uh, topics that could uh, be a debate unto themselves. But I think it's important for us to consider when we ask the question, who is like Jesus? What do we mean when we say that? Well, Adnan has given his perspective. Now, I would like to give my own. If we want to simply talk about outward appearances, if we want to talk about things that would, for example, be derived from living in a Semitic culture uh, in antiquity, even though, uh, uh, you know, exactly when the Quran was written and the New Testament taking place, there's a half millennium in between. But, but still, if we were simply looking at things like that, dietary laws and the things that would be associated with life in antiquity, then obviously we have to recognize that the question would be, does the New Testament teach us to be like Jesus in those things. And one of the differences between Christianity and Islam is that the gospel message is meant to go out to every nation. It does not bring a particular cultural aspect to it, such as clothing or dietary laws or things like that. It is meant to be a message that will go to all nations at all times. And as such, we are not called to dress like Jesus or eat like Jesus. In fact, the New Testament writers give very little evidence of having any interest in such things. Even though in the Hadith, you have tremendous amount of information about how many dates Muhammad would want to eat and, and uh, the odd number rather than the even number and, and all sorts of details like that. New Testament writers show no interest in any of that. And the reason for that is that they did not believe that Christianity is something that is to be passed on that will have some type of cultural normativity. There are moral and ethical laws and principles, but they must be applied in whatever situation the church finds itself in. 
And so why are we really even debating this particular subject? Because Christianity does not make a claim that Christians are supposed to look outwardly like Jesus or behave like him in a cultural context. If in fact, I would ask our, our Muslim friends, if Jesus is but a Rasul of Allah and only a Rasul of Allah, in other words, that, that, that section in Surah 4, 171, specifically is denying that there is anything beyond that calling that would mark Jesus, because that's the same section that says, do not say three, so on and so forth. If he's merely a Rasul of Allah, why are we even here tonight? Why are we even talking about emulating someone? I mean, from the Muslim perspective, Jesus was just the, the Jewish Messiah. He was not the Messiah for all people. He was just the Jewish Messiah. So why would we even be discussing something like this? Now, it is interesting to me um, that Adnan had just said, well, you know, we have a different view of Christ, we have the Quranic view of Christ, but I would like to suggest to you that you are dependent upon the New Testament for most of what you just said about Jesus, because the Quran only mentions the name 25 times, maybe just less than 100 times total references. You're given very, very little information about Jesus. It's plain that the author of the Quran assumes that his readers are going to be familiar with the New Testament's testimony about Jesus. And so nothing is given. There's only one place in all the Quran where Jesus speaks from identifiable historical location, and that's his cradle. And that comes from non-canonical sources, not from the New Testament sources itself. So the, the background material from the Islamic perspective is dependent on the New Testament at a non's presentation quoted from the Gospels, quoted even from the Gospel of John. Why? Because we have to. That's the only way we can know anything about Jesus. These sources tell us many ways in which we cannot emulate Jesus. For example, Muslims cannot emulate him in raising the dead or being virgin born, both uh, things that are uh, specifically affirmed of Jesus's capacities and abilities. Christians cannot emulate him in being eternally glorious in the presence of the Father, as we read only a matter of one sentence after the text that Adnan quoted from John 17, 3, you have John 17, 5, where Jesus shows that he is aware of his glorious preexistence in the presence of the Father before the world was. So here is one person speaking to another person, speaking of the time in eternity when those two persons were co-glorious in eternity past. That comes right after Jesus' words of John 17, 3. So whatever you do with 17, 3, you've got to understand what else is said in the rest of the Gospel of John. So Christians cannot emulate him in being eternally glorious with the Father. We cannot be the Son of God. He is identified as the Son of God in each of the Gospels, and not just a Son of God, as if God has sons by the tons, as someone used to like to say, but the unique Son of God, so much so that when he used that terminology of himself in John chapter 5, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. They wanted, both John 5 and John 10 and John 8, happened a number of times, uh, because of the uniqueness of the claim that Jesus made to be the Son of God. What is more, we cannot emulate him in bearing the very divine name Yahweh. Yahweh. Jesus is identified as Yahweh in John chapter 12. John says that Isaiah saw Jesus in Isaiah chapter 6. You go back to Isaiah chapter 6. Who was it that Isaiah saw? He saw Yahweh, the early Followers of Jesus who wrote the New Testament repeatedly identified Jesus with the one divine name, the specific divine name, much more specific than, than what you have in Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani. Yahweh is the divine covenant name of God, and it is used of Jesus. We cannot emulate him in doing that. We cannot emulate him in having a people to worship us but Jesus, in Mark chapter 14, verses 61 through 64 at his trial, quotes from the Old Testament. And when we look back at the text that he's quoting, he's talking about that situation in Daniel where there is one who's brought before the Ancient of Days and he is worshipped by his people. He has a people who worship him, giving him the highest form of worship. 
And so we cannot be worshipped. We have not been worshipped in heaven. We are not to be worshipped on earth. Jesus accepted the worship of his disciples and others while on earth, something that there is no way that the Islamic Jesus would ever accept because if you accept the thesis that Jesus actually worshipped a unipersonal or unitarian God, then Jesus would never allow himself to be worshipped. Jesus would never allow Thomas to say to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus says to him, now that you've seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. No rebuke of Thomas. Instead, recognition of the fact that Thomas is speaking in faith. Likewise, we cannot be the object of prayer that Jesus was. In John chapter 14, in talking about going back in the presence of the Father, he talks about how after that having happened, we can ask him anything in his name and he will do it, directed to him. Has to be in the form of prayer. The early Christians are identified in 1 Corinthians as those who call upon the name of the Lord, specifically in that context, Jesus. And while Jesus said all authority in heaven and earth was given to him, we are not given that authority in any way, shape, or form. And so there are many ways in which the biblical Jesus is someone that we cannot emulate because of the fact that he is more than just a man. He is a true man. There is no question that he took on flesh. The word took on flesh, but he cannot be limited solely to those categories. But we are, in fact, to emulate him in calling upon God as Father, just as he did. It is a tremendous privilege to call upon God as Father. And yet, my Muslim friends do not believe that Jesus ever prayed in this way. How could he use that kind of terminology? That is inappropriate terminology for anyone to use in regards to Allah, to refer to him as Father. But Jesus did this over and over and over again, and in and through him, not because of anything in ourselves, but because of who we are in him, we have the tremendous privilege of being able to pray to God as to our Father. We do so trusting that Jesus has, in fact, revealed the Father to us perfectly as no one else could possibly do. He's called the exact representation of his person. That's how we can have absolute confidence of who God the Father is and absolute confidence of his love for us because he has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. There is no arbitrariness in regards to our understanding of whether God will, be, will, be, will fulfill his promises to us. We have the promises of Jesus Christ. We are called to trust in God as Jesus did on the cross when he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Our Muslim friends don't believe that ever took place. They don't believe Jesus ever said those words because there was no cross, well, at least most Muslims. I've debated a few Muslims who have variant views on that, but the vast majority of Muslims in the world do not believe that that ever took place. And yet here we have the very central aspect of every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what is the focus of every single one of them? They're all taking us to the cross, the very center point of history. And there, Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And that, of course, is what every believing Christian can say at their dying moment as well. Father, into your hands I, can, I commit my spirit. That is because of the finished work that he has provided there on the cross. We are called to fulfill the greatest commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, because in that, Jesus taught, all the law is fulfilled. So we do have a law. And in fact, the New Testament speaks of the law of Christ. The issue is that we do not take a singular law and then attempt to apply it without any type of differentiation from culture to culture to culture. We take overarching principles and then we have to deal with them. And I'm glad that's the case. Today we're dealing with genetic engineering and nuclear war and all sorts of things like that. And we need to have something like the law of Christ that we are able to apply beyond merely the scope of the ancient world into the modern world in which we live. God knew the world was going to be like this. He gives us those in-depth principles within that context. 
Now you see, I think one of the things would be very helpful for us this evening. In Islam, Jesus is a disciple of Allah. He's a Rasul, but he is one who follows Allah. He submits to Allah. Jesus is a disciple of Allah. In Christianity, Jesus is the very embodiment of God in human flesh, the eternal son who took on a perfect human nature. Hence, our call is not resemblance with a fellow disciple, but our call is being disciples of Jesus himself. So the relationship is not supposed to be one merely of resemblance. It is supposed to be one of following. And Jesus himself taught that in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. And I want to uh, direct you, if you do have a Bible, to Mark, chapter 8. After the revelation to Peter that Jesus is the Christ, uh, as recorded in Matthew, the Son of the living God, Jesus instructs the disciples not to tell anyone this yet. It's that time had not yet come. Then you have the situation where Jesus from that time begins to teach that it was necessary to go to Jerusalem, that he be betrayed, that he be killed and rise again the third day. This is a central part of the gospel message itself. And Paul, or Peter, I'm sorry, tries to rebuke Jesus. Jesus rebukes Peter, says, get behind me. You're minding the things of men rather than the things of God. And then in verse 34, I want you to hear what happens because Jesus calls the crowd to himself. It's not that there's just a crowd around. He actually gathers the crowd and he calls them to himself together with his disciples. And he says to them, if you wish to follow after me, if you wish to follow after me, not if you wish to follow after God, if you wish to follow after me, Jesus, as he did so often in the New Testament, so often in the Gospels, places himself in the center and says, if you would follow after me, you must do something. You must deny yourself and do what? Take up the cross and follow me. Take up his cross. He says, if anyone does this, he must take up his cross and follow after me. Deny yourself. Put your desires and your dreams, they're done away with. Because you see, if you say to anyone in this day, take up your cross, they all know what you mean. Jesus is saying, if you want to be my disciple, you must join the death march. And everybody had seen it, especially there in Jerusalem. The Romans had been, Romans were good at keeping people in subjection. And they had lined the roads in Judea with crosses when there had been rebellions in the past. And you had seen that horrible, horrific way of dying. And so Jesus, Jesus is not using sweets and cake and money to get people to follow him. He is saying, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, die to the old way of life, and join the death march. The death march, which was so shameful, was so shameful. You must take up your cross. That's the only way you can follow me. Now, notice that this is right in the section where he's saying, I must go to Jerusalem and I must be killed. I must be buried and rise again the third day. So we know what he's talking about here. He says, whoever, whoever desires to save his life, or literally his soul, will lose it. But whoever loses his soul, what? For me and what? And my gospel. For me and my gospel. He will save it. Now, folks, it's just right here that we have to get serious with each other. Very serious with each other. I really like this guy over here. When we first met, you seemed a little angry. That's because he was used to Speaker's Corner. And Speaker's Corner does things to you. But then in Dublin, Ireland, I insisted between two debates that we did that we have lunch together. And all of a sudden, Adnan found out that I'm a human being. 
And I happen to be a human being who does what I do because I really believe that what I'm saying is true. And to the Muslim people, I actually love you. And you may disagree with my, you may say, well, you misrepresent us, but you know I'm not trying to. I am trying to be accurate in my representations as much as I can to show respect for you. And yet we keep doing debates. And the world says, well, if you really liked each other, you'd stop debating. No. What I believe and what Adnan believes are not the same thing. There is no way to take these two positions and meld them into Chrislam. <laughs> that would be tremendously disrespectful to what you believe and tremendously disrespectful to what I believe. Surah 112, Ayah 3, if it's right, I'm wrong. If it's wrong, then I'm right. I think that's the way I put it. There's no way, there's no way to put these two things together. I wish it were not the case, but if you love someone, you will tell them the truth. That's what our society doesn't understand anymore. We're not allowed to do that anymore. And so why are we here? Here's the most important thing. Jesus identifies what it means to follow him. And Jesus says, if you will be my disciple, you must deny yourself and take up your cross. There's one ayah in the Quran, Surah 4, 157, that keeps you from being able to do that if you're a Muslim. Where did that ayah come from? Now, we've done debates on the cross. There, I believe there was one that you said Samuel Green was the one you did debate recently. I've done debates on the cross with a number of people, even here in London. We'll do more in the future. But the point is that in Jesus' own words, to truly be a disciple of him, you must be willing to die with him. That is not the type of language a mere Razul uses. That's what every true Christian, not just the Christian who got baptized as a baby and thinks they're a Christian, the person who has truly made a commitment to Jesus Christ, dies to self and takes up the cross, that's the only way we can be made like him, is to follow his own words. Thank you for your attention. Ten minutes, ten minutes, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, James, for that passionate sermon. I always like James' preaching. He's a very eloquent preacher. He has been telling Christians how to follow Jesus. He didn't quite explain how Christians today actually resemble historic Jesus. Let me quickly explain. He's right that it took me a while to see him as a human, not as... Uh, someone who is out there to spread hate against Muslims because I thought James is just like other Christian apologists, missionaries around the world, a lot of whom are spreading hate against Islam and Muslims actively. They are part of the Islamophobia industry. Some of those people have, have, have actually attacked James for doing the amazing work he is doing for his people. James and myself are victims of extremists. And thankfully, we are not extremists. This is why we are here to talk with love and compassion so that our people can see that not every single Christian or Muslim apologist or debaters or scholars or activists are the same. 
There are people who want to have peace in this world, who want to share, share love and compassion. And therefore, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that I love you all. The reason why I'm here today is because I love the Christians. I want the Christians to see our viewpoint. I want to lift this barrier that has been created by hateful individuals out there online so that you can see what the Muslim perspective is from the Muslims. So, what did James talk about? James talked about a lot of things and he did not address, obviously that was his opening statement, so I cannot really hold him accountable on that. But there are many points I raised and I was directly addressing the topic, resemblance. How do we actually resemble Jesus Christ? Right? Is it only outward, ritual, ritual, ritualistic resemblance? Do we only uh, resemble Jesus in dress code, how he had a beard and how he walked around like a Muslim, looking like a Muslim? No. It is more to do with inward resemblance, which is belief. I talked about it. Jesus did not worship a Trinitarian God. James actually confirmed it, that he was talking to the Father. Why do the Muslims use, uh, accept that language? Because we believe things done previously were allowed. For example, the Muslims believe prostration to important people in the previous uh, laws and regulations was allowed. For example, uh, the family of Joseph bowed to him. It is now haram in Islam. Therefore, to use the word father for God Almighty is not allowed in Islam, but it was allowed for the previous generations, previous prophets. They could use these words because people understood the context. They knew. But later on, the term father was misunderstood by Greek philosophers and uh, Hellenistic thinkers who basically painted the word father in a very different light and they started to claim that Jesus and the Father of the same, were of the same essence. I'm not going to indulge in a lot of things G James talked about when he preached about how uh, you, know, you must carry the cross and follow Jesus in death and all of that. I'm not going to, because that's not the topic today. The topic is resemble. How do the Christians resemble Jesus? Historic Jesus. In beliefs, most importantly. Not entirely, not particularly or specifically in rituals. I have clarified already that we pray like Jesus. We the Muslims pray like Jesus. Christians don't. Right? We fast like him. We are circum... I mean, we are men circumcised like him because he was circumcised. Right? And we do not uh, eat swine. We don't consume swine meat. Jesus did not do that. Jesus followed the law. And we follow the divine law. The law of Jesus was not the law of the Christ, which was later on conceived by Christians. The law of Jesus was the Mosaic law. That was the law he was talking about in chapter uh, 5 of the book of Matthew. When he talked about the law, he was talking about the Mosaic law. He was not talking about a new law or, or another law. When he said, I have come to fulfill the law, he was talking about the Mosaic law. What happened to the Mosaic law? It is Paul who came later and gave Christians what they believe in today. If you put the writings of Paul on the one side, what he said in his epistles, 13 of his epistles, and the rest of the New Testament books on the other side, what the gospel authors are talking about, saying about Jesus, you will see a direct contradiction in some cases. You will see there is a conflict. Jesus is telling his disciples to follow the law, the commandments, if you want, if you want salvation. Paul comes along and he tells us, no, the law has been abolished. Then James comes along and James condemns Paul. James states that there is no faith without works. And this conflict is not actually detected by the Muslims. Muslims do not have any interest in highlighting these problems in the Bible. We have the Quran. Uh, James, he mentioned something very interesting, very important. And why are we even looking into the New Testament? The reason I as a Muslim is pointing out these things in the New Testament is because you are Christians. You do not believe in the Quran. I want to show you from your scriptures that Jesus resembles Muslims more than he resembles you. If you are not worshipping like him, believing like him, or doing things like him, then how are you actually following historic Jesus? You are following Paul. Every single thing you believe in on Jesus is, has come to you through the lens of Paul. You are reading into the life of Jesus through the lens of Paul. Remove Paul. Who is Paul, by the way? Paul is someone who never met Jesus, never knew him in person. You have put all your belief in one basket. The vision he had on the road to Damascus 
and you have completely ignored the actual disciples of Jesus Christ. The ones who lived with him, ate with him, talked with him, walked with him. People like James. What is James saying in his epistle? If you read all the epistles of Paul, 13 of them, what will you see? The person of Christ, not the teachings of Christ. When you read one epistle, the epistle of James is all about the teachings of Christ. Every single thing James is talking about is to do with Christ. What he taught, what he did. So James is more for looking like Christ, doing like Christ and being like Christ rather than Paul ignoring Christ and following his view on Christ which is actually very inconsistent with the view of Christ according to the Christ himself. So this is very very important for you to look into. And why am I pointing out these inconsistencies? Because when you look at the evidence you see that in the book of Acts chapter 21 James who had the authority which Paul himself acknowledges Paul in the book of Galatians acknowledges that James is the most important person from the followers of Jesus Christ to an extent that Paul himself goes to James to get matters fixed. Who is James? Why is Paul going to James? Why is Paul even listening to James? Why? Because James is very important. Very, very important. James is not teaching any of that. James didn't talk about the divinity of Christ. Nothing on the Trinity. Nothing on the abolition of the law or law being a curse. Rather, James is a law-abiding Jew who followed the Christ, who believed in the Christ. He clearly had different views from Paul. So Christians today are actually following Paul. They are imitating Paul. They resemble Paul, not Jesus Christ, as I have already clarified. Coming to the beliefs, I asked a very specific question from uh, James. James came and did a lot of beautiful preaching, which is fine. This is a church. This is what he's supposed to be doing. But my job is to highlight the inconsistencies. Where is the inconsistency? If Jesus is worshipping the Father, clearly in the New Testament, why is he not worshipping a trinity? What is he teaching his disciples? Why is he deceiving his disciples if he is a trinitarian? He should be telling his disciples, there is a trinity in the heavens and we worship that trinity. Why is he worshipping unipersonal God? A unipersonal God called the Father, called the Ilaha. Right? Why is Jesus worshipping that unipersonal God is a very important question. In that, most importantly, and this is something inward, this is to do with belief, not outward rituals. I agree with James that if you outwardly uh, look like someone, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are like that person or you are following that person. I agree. But how are the Christians following Jesus today? How are they following Jesus if they believe in a trinity? Jesus never taught a trinity, never worshipped a trinity, never preached it. Why are the Christians following or worshipping a trinity? It's a very important question. Jesus was a strict monotheist who worshipped a unipersonal God. That means one person, one being, the Father. And he taught his companions that, his disciples that, as confirmed by James himself. So ladies and gentlemen, I really want you to contemplate on not only outward resemblance of Jesus, also the inward resemblance of Jesus when it comes to beliefs. What beliefs did Jesus hold on divinity and on following the law? Thank you so much for listening. The real problem with debates like this is you get 10 minutes to respond to 20 minutes of what the other guy said. There's a problem with that. It takes you longer to respond to things than it does to make assertions. But let me just get to a few important things. Uh, it was said that my preaching on what Jesus said in Mark chapter 8 was not on the topic tonight. It is the topic tonight. 
when Jesus defines what it is to be his follower, to be like him, to be one of those who believe what he has to say, to hold his beliefs, when Jesus lays it out, The way he does it is impossible for a Muslim to believe. And we we were told, well, you know, we're just only using the New Testament tonight because you're Christians. And so we're showing you where the inconsistencies are. The problem is, I would like to challenge Adnan, tell us something about what Jesus said or did without using the New Testament. All you have are a couple of disjointed ahistorical statements in the Quran. You've got nothing. You have nothing that's from any identifiable historical place in the Quran. And even then, you're talking about 600 years down the road without a shred of historical evidence that goes back to the first century. You are dependent upon the New Testament. The problem is you then have to pick and choose what of the New Testament you're going to believe. Now, there was a lot said about Paul. Interestingly enough, and those who are watching this will, will mention, you know what the topic I wanted to get for the debate for a, a debate uh, for this trip? Was Paul a true apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm coming back in November. Let's make it happen. Because I will defend that and I will demonstrate it from the text of Scripture. The statements made about Paul, especially his understanding of law, I'm sorry, are just misguided. They do not understand Paul's understanding. He himself said in Romans chapter 3, after he says we're justified by faith, do we then do away with the law? No, we establish the law. He said the law was good. It's the law of God. You just have to understand what the purpose of the law was. It's to show us our sin and drive us to a savior. Once you understand that, then you understand that so much of the accusation against Paul simply does not follow. Now, we were told that that Jesus taught a unipersonal God. Now, how does that work? If, now again, the only way you can make this work is if you cut up the New Testament into parts. You accept one part of a book and another part of another book. You reject that another part, another part, so on and so forth. But I'm not quoted from John chapter 8. So let's go with just John chapter 8. How does Jesus identify himself in John chapter 8? First of all, he identifies the Father as the one who has sent him. He also says that he always does the will of the Father. And he also says that unless you believe that ego I me, I am, you will die in your sins. John 8, 24. At the end of the chapter, he says before Abraham was, ego I me, I am. And the Jews picked up stones to stone him. Now, who believes Jesus' words? Christians or Muslims? Muslims don't even believe he said those words. So how can you quote from John chapter 8 and then take out the parts that clearly state something that is directly opposed to the conclusions of the Quran? You can't do that. And so when it is asserted unipersonal God, Jesus identifies the Father as a distinct person from himself, And yet, he identifies himself with the Father as having the one glory of God. He is worshipped by the disciples. When Thomas calls him my my Lord and my God, he does not rebuke him. In Matthew, after his resurrection, the disciples worship him. He does not rebuke them. This is consistent with everything else that goes on into the text of Paul and Acts and the other New Testament writers. And let me just give you one example, since some people will say, well... You know, I don't know that we can really trust what John has to say. Uh, I prefer a more primitive gospel. Okay, Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, the trial of Jesus. When Jesus is asked, I abjure you, are you the Christ, the son of the living God? How does Jesus respond? The first words out of his mouth are, ego I me. The same words he uttered in John 8, 24 and 8, 58, by the way. I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus takes two citations, one from Psalm 110, the other from Daniel. He puts them together. Every intertestamental Jew, every Jew of the first century knew exactly what those texts were about. And if you go back to Daniel and look at that text, the one who appears before the Ancient of Days is worshipped, highest level of worship, by his own people. Jesus is identifying himself with this heavenly being, not a mere Razul of Surah 4171. 
And how did the Jews understand this? The chief priest, he tears his clothing and he says, what further evidence do we need? You've heard the what? The blasphemy yourself. And Jesus doesn't go, oh, no, 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 no. You misunderstand. I'm just a mere Razul. I'm just pointing you to Allah. That's not what happens. Jesus does this purposefully. If that's the case, then where do you get this unipersonal God? You have to accept everything that the New Testament teaches. And so when Jesus can identify the Father as a distinct person from himself and yet accept worship, when both the Father is identified as Yahweh, Jesus is identified as Yahweh, the Spirit is the Spirit of Yahweh, when Jesus can say, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that is not baptizing in the name of Allah, a Mirazul, and the angel Jabril. There is one name and three persons sharing that one name. Sounds like the, oh, the doctrine of the Trinity, which we find in the earliest Christian writers, not 381 AD. But if you go look at Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch on his way to martyrdom in Rome in 107 or 108 AD, not only does he identify Jesus as God at least 10 times in his genuine letters, he also uses illustrations of the Trinity there. Does he use the term Trinity? No, but he talks about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit together in ways that definitely demonstrate their unity as the object of his worship. That's another subject that we could get into. I've taught church history since 1990, and so it'll be a good one to get into. And so when it comes to beliefs, I simply ask if, I, I ask every Muslim person and every Christian person in this audience, when Thomas sees Jesus, and Z Jesus says, do not be unbelieving, but believe, shows him the wounds of an act that you as a Muslim don't believe ever happened, because of one 140 word ayah written over 600 years after the events. All, all of the first century material, everything from 100 years after that period of time, says the same thing. Jesus Christ died under Pontius Pilate on the cross. Every bit of it. But you reject that for something 600 years later that has no historical background to it. But Jesus appears before Thomas. And Thomas looks at him and says, My Lord and my God. What should Jesus have done if Surah 4171 is true? Surah 4171. Do not say three. Jesus is a mere Razul, a mere apostle, a sent one of Allah. Nothing more than that. Do not say of Allah anything but the truth. Don't go into excess is what Surah 4171 says. Look it up. I'm not misrepresenting you. If that is the case, what should Jesus have said? There should have been an immediate rebuke, just as there was in the book of Revelation, when John bowed down to the angel who had shown him all these incredible things. When John bows down to worship the angel, the angel says, do not do that. I am merely a fellow servant of God. Worship God alone. That's what Jesus' duty would have been. And Jesus' response is, because you've seen me, have you believed, Thomas? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So, I do think this is the issue. Will we follow Jesus' own teaching? Is that how we become like him? Well, if we're going to be consistent, then that's what we need to do. I didn't have time to get into the Mosaic Law and things like that. Just touched on those things very, very briefly. Obviously, good topics for future debates, as long as I will still be allowed into England after the uh, next few years. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Okay. So it's, it's my turn first. So this is the crossfires part of the debate where we actually ask each other questions for five minutes each. Uh, it's my turn to ask questions, and I will keep it as short, as brief as possible. So 
James, coming back to the, the two main points I raised about inward resemblance of Jesus. Because outward, you don't seem to make a big deal out of it. Outward resemblance is not as important as inward resemblance in your view. Uh, I can somewhat agree with you, but again, in, outward is very important also. Uh, Worshipping like Jesus, like prostration is very important. Christians don't do that today. They have historically, to my knowledge, uh, Trinitarians in particular, Trinitarians have never worshipped God like that. I mean, to my knowledge. Maybe there are exceptions, but I'm talking... Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming to that. So, uh, if Trinitarians did not worship God, the Father, or the Trinity by prostrating, how are the Trinitarians actually imitating or resembling Jesus Christ in worship. Okay, yeah, I, I didn't get to a response to the prostration stuff. Uh, each one of the examples you gave were unusual examples. For example, the uh, high priestly prayer of Jesus, the example of Jesus' prayer to the Father in John chapter 17, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. He was not prostrated at all. So there is no singular uh, bodily orientation uh, that is that is demanded the examples you gave from the Old Testament in regards to like the ordination of priests and things like that But there's your consistency. I'm sorry. There's your consistency all the prophets that no. we know of Prayed like that and so did Jesus. I don't I don't I don't think that's the case at all uh, Well, you don't said, you don't think those no, references? No. I just no. gave you an example of where Jesus didn't pray like that Yeah, I'm it talking is, about when he did pray like it that is and a, he was, Yeah, it is we you are free to adopt any bodily position it is not something that is demanded that you have to prostrate. Did you, did and so there are Christians who pray in every bodily position. I understand that. I'm saying Jesus was very consistent with previous prophets. With the Old Testament examples I gave from Genesis, from First Chronicles, from the book of Daniel as well, there are examples. David prayed like that. David, Daniel, uh, Abraham, the Moses, priest, Aaron. The the priests did not, though. For example, if you look at how no, 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 pre the prayers the priests also prayed like that. But, yes. They, yes. But, but there is no command that they were to prostrate in the offering of sacrifices or any of the things, that they, the situations. In so the how community. do you resemble someone in, so, in worship? Well, by f worshiping the same God they did. The way they did it, right? No, it doesn't have to be the way they did it. I, they, I've never, I think it would be very distracting to most of us if we tried to worship God in this place to the smell of sacrifices. But do you not see there is a consistency in prostration? Do no, you, I do not. You don't no. see that? No, I do not. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it there then, no problem. Okay. Um, next question I have is, uh, Jesus, we Muslims uh, resemble Jesus strikingly in, in our belief. We worship a unipersonal God. Jesus, whenever he worshipped God in the New Testament, he worshipped a unipersonal God called the Father. So why do the Christians worship the Trinity when Jesus did not? I just, just gave the, the answer to that in my, in my closing statement. Mm -hmm. It is allowing all that the New Testament teaches, all the Gospels teach. You cannot come to the conclusion when Jesus says, glorify me, Father, with the glory which I had in your presence before the world began. How do you take that and say that Jesus did not exist as a glorified, as a glorified object of the worship of the angelic creatures in eternity past. Great. So why is Jesus playing these games? Why is he not coming out straight and saying, I am part of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is also part of the Trinity. Well, Father is part of the Trinity. Well, worship well, the Trinity. Why well, is Jesus playing these indirect, vague games with his followers? Why does he, like the Father, Thousands of places in the, in the Old Testament. Okay, he tells, I'm the Father. Let me, let me, let me answer that. You're asking, yeah. you're, let, let's keep the, the question succinct. Yeah. I believe God has the right to reveal his truth in the timing that he desires to do so. And so there, here's, here's an, where you and I disagree, even though I, it's very plain. But James, the same a, thing with a the sentence Quran. would do it. A sentence would do it. But you're demanding the timing in which there is going to be revelation. I'm saying yes. no. Until the exaltation of the Son, why reveal something that will not be able to be understood by people? Until, until the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon the church, hmm. how can you even begin to explain right. what the Trinity is? But Jesus could easily tell his disciples, in the future, uh, this conception of the divinity will be clarified. So there will be three people you will have to worship, three persons within one being. 
Well, it's one sentence. If it's so important, is that the alarm? I Time guess it was. Okay. It's also a pretty song too, but sorry about that. But can I, can I very, very quickly, if I answer, I'm, I'm just very, very briefly, you're making a, you're basically saying God has to reveal these things on my timetable rather than allowing God to do it in his timetable. And I would argue that there are certain things in the Quran and in Islamic theology that flow along the same lines need to be consistent. Okay. But. Your time. My time. Okay, so let's, let's go back to, it, it does seem that we are focusing in upon the key issue that to be like someone is to believe what they themselves teach, right? Also uh, outwardly as well as inwardly, which is belief, yes. Okay, <clears throat> so could you answer the question that I gave uh, to the audience? What should Jesus have said to Thomas? In John 20. Very good question. I think Jesus did make a correction when someone called him good and he said, why do you call me good when no one is good but God? In this verse, we get a clear answer from Jesus that he is saying to his followers, he is not God because he actually separated himself from the, the notion of being God in any shape or form. If he was God, as you claim he was, then this was the point to say, yes, I'm good because I'm God, right? But he makes that distinction. What he might have said to Thomas, we don't know. What Thomas actually said, in what language Thomas said that to him, again, the language is very important. Moses is called God. Do you believe Moses is God? Moses is called God in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, Moses is God to Pharaoh, right? Now, what do you mean by God here? This is another question. Yeah. Okay, so you... You're not, do, you, do you believe that this encounter actually took place in John 20 at all? Okay, my view on the Old Testament... Uh, um, I didn't say the Old Testament, I said John chapter Sorry, the New Testament, sorry, the New Testament. Uh, I believe the New, we don't, as Muslims, we don't need the New Testament to know anything about Jesus. We believe in Jesus because of the Quran, right? So we believe there are many things in the, in the New Testament that are dubious. And there are many things that are definitely from God. Originally, they came from Revelation. Jesus definitely said those things. For example, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We believe that. We believe those are the words of Jesus. Okay. But other things, other people saying, how do we know? When you cited the text where Jesus is speaking to the rich young ruler, you understood that to be Jesus saying, I'm not God. Right? Just now? I, I have no problem in accepting that those are the words of Jesus. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you understand Jesus to be saying there, I'm not God? So that means Jesus was saying, I'm not good. You, you right? tell me what he means there. What do you tell me? I'm, I, I, am... I, can't, I can't do that. I have to ask the, I'm, I'm asking Oh, questions. sorry. Okay. No. Um, I'd be happy to tell you. I'll, I'll do it in my closing <laughs> statement. How's that? But my, my point That's is, good. I, need to, I want it to be made clear. Yeah. You have an interpretation of that text mm -hmm. that would fundamentally be Jesus saying, I am not good. Right? No, that's not my understanding. This is humility on the part of Jesus, which he himself taught his companions, like the example of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee saying, I, will, I will fast twice a week. The, the, tax collector, collect, the tax collector is not even looking at the heavens and he's saying, God, I'm a sinner, forgive me. God, I'm a sinner, forgive me. This is the same message we get from Muhammad as well, where uh, he was asked, why do you even ask for worship? He says, shall I not be a thankful servant of Allah? Shall I not even be thankful because Allah has given me such a high status? So this is the humility of Jesus as a prophet, as a messenger of God. So is it, is it possible that what's going on with rich young ruler is that Jesus is in fact identifying himself as God and the rich young ruler doesn't see it? He's the very one that gave him the law that the rich young ruler is pretending to have followed? I, I don't think Jesus claims to be God anywhere directly or indirectly anywhere in the New Testament. Uh, Christians have to use insinuations, inferences from other people or the other statements uh, that are not clear. Even ego I me is not clear. Okay, what does it prove? It proves that Jesus is pre-existent. He has eternally existed. How does that prove he's God? I believe I have pre-existed in the knowledge of God. God knew Adnan Rashid will be born once in, in the future, James White will be debating him on the so, 20... Sorry, what's the date today? So, 2nd uh, second of, second, second of, second of May. God knew what the date yeah. was too. But, yeah. um, so, this has existed in God's knowledge eternally. God knew. So, when Jesus says, 
before Abraham was born, I am. Hmm. You insert in that somewhere, I am in the foreknowledge of God? Somewhere? Yes, 100%. That's, that's how I understand then it. Then yes. why did the Jews pick up stones to stone him? Because they would have believed that about everybody. Just Good like question. You. Good question. And when they did pick up the stones, how did Jesus defend himself? Does it not say in your law that you are sons of God? That's and I'm John only claiming. Not John 8. Sorry? That's John 10, not John Yeah, John, John 10, but similar incident where Jews pick up stones to stone him, right? Yeah. And Jesus responds by saying that I am only claiming to be the Son of God. And it, it says in your scripture, Psalm 82 verse 6, that you are God's. I'm only claiming to be a Son of God. So I would this is... love to discuss that, but we're out of time. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. So our... <laughs> Concluding remarks. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being present to listen to both of us, and we appreciate your time and your effort to make your way. I would like to uh, thank Selhurst Church in Norwood, uh, South London, for accommodating this debate. We really, really, from the depth of our hearts, appreciate that, and I would like to thank Dr. James White for another opportunity to have a very friendly and compassionate dialogue debate with him. Uh, what are we left with? We are left with uh, a, a number of points. I had raised few points to highlight how Muslims resemble Jesus. We resemble uh, not only outwardly, we resemble him not only outwardly, we resemble him inwardly. It is very clear that Jesus did not teach the Trinity anywhere. He did not teach his divinity anywhere. Christians today have to rely on external um, statements made by other people to make that insinuation. Nowhere in the New Testament we find a statement where Jesus said, I am God. This is all he had to do. Instead of going around the world uh, and making uh, vague statements, if he really wants people to believe that he's God, he could simply do it like God the Father did in the Old Testament. Thousands of places, God the Father introduces himself by saying, I am your God, worship me. I am a jealous God. I am your God. I am your God. I am your God, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses. I am your God. Again and again, the Father is speaking like that. But Jesus does not speak like that anywhere. What we do find from Jesus, however, is clear-cut negation of his divinity if he was divine. He told people clearly he cannot be God. Like the example I gave earlier, when someone called him good, he said, Why do you call me good when God alone is good? In John 17, 3, he tells his followers, Father is the only true God. In the Greek language, uh, language monos, alitinos, alone uh, true. If Father alone is true, then others cannot be true. It's simple, simple logic. So uh, Muslims resemble Jesus not only outwardly in the fasting, in the prayer, um, in the prostration. We talked about prostration, how Muslims prostrate when they pray. Jesus prayed by prostrate, prostrating to God. Abraham prayed by prostrating to God. Moses prayed like that. Aaron prayed like that. Daniel prayed like that. David prayed like that. Consistent way of praying to God. Which Jesus upheld. And the Christians amazingly do not follow him in that today. They have never, the Trinitarians have never followed Jesus in that. Worshipping God by prostrating. Likewise, we have examples uh, of, for example, Jesus was circumcised. How many Christians believe in actually circumcising? They don't, the Christians don't believe in circumcising. Christians eat pig. For them, it's, it's not a problem. A lot of people in the West, uh, the Western world, is predominantly Christian, uh, depending on where you're looking at, um, or what you're looking at. <laughs> uh, um, pork is a delicacy. People love their ham sandwiches and black pudding, all of that. Jesus, if he was alive, he would be the first person to tell these Christians, what are you doing? You are actually eating something I abhorred, which was forbidden by the law. Why are you not circumcised? Why do you not actually pray like me? Why are you worshipping three persons in one being? When did I teach you that? When did I tell you to do that? You're doing it just because Thomas made a vague statement somewhere? Is that, did I tell you to do that? No. Jesus on the day of judgment, he will be asking Christians these. And throughout Christian history, nearly 2,000 years, if you look at Christian history, how did the Christians actually follow Jesus in actions, in worship, in belief? If you minus Paul, 
If you take Paul out, who never met Jesus, who claimed to have a vision, which the Christians have whole, wholeheartedly accepted at the expense of the teachings of uh, direct disciples of Jesus, then what are you left with if you minus Paul? You are left with Jesus his, with his prostration, with his circumcision, with his dietary rules, with his following of the Mosaic law, with his strictly monotheistic view on divinity. Worship one God alone. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. How clear do you want him to be? What more do you want from him? If he's God, he should have said, I am God, so is the Holy Spirit, the Father you have been worshipping for centuries. Now there are three in one. Worship three persons in one being. Never did we find that with Jesus. I hope you can see the resemblance clearly between Muslims and Jesus. And uh, Christians do not in those things resemble Jesus Christ. Rather they resemble Paul more than Jesus. Thank you so much for listening ladies and gentlemen. Okay, very, very quickly, in Mark chapter 7, verse 19, Jesus declared all meats to be clean. Uh, so the, given the fact that he is the Lord Jesus Christ and he is the one who created all meats, I accept what he has to say, and therefore I follow him, and uh, the entire discussion of that is now over. Uh, in uh, uh, James chapter 2, verse 1, we had a, a question earlier, why didn't James believe in these things? The brother of Jesus in James 2.1 speaks of him as the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Does that sound like a mirror azul? The glorious, that's, a very, that's doxa, that's the very glory of God, the same glory that Jesus talks about in John 17. James viewed Jesus as the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. It's perfectly consistent with what we've been saying, not consistent with the person who believes Jesus is only a mere azul, as we see in Surah 4, 171. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, nor they might know you, Tan Alethanon Theon, Kai, Han Apestilas Yesun Christon. Please note what it actually says. What is eternal life? To know you, the only true God, and, and, wa in Arabic. There's a connective there and the one whom you have sent, Jesus Christ. If you want to have eternal life, you have to know the Father and the Son. How could you associate a mere creature in this way? Well, if you don't just stop at that sentence and read the next sentence, the same one identifies himself and says, and now glorify me, Father, together with yourself with the glory which I had in your presence before the world came into existence. Nothing about knowledge which I had in your presence. The Son was in the presence of the Father eternally and was glorious. That's what the scriptures state. That's what allowing the scriptures to speak state. And in John 17, 3, you say, well, he's, no, he's, he's saying Jesus, Jesus is saying that only the Father is God. No, Jesus is saying that he's not an atheist. There is only one true God. The Father is one true God. So is the Son, so is the Spirit. That's why they share the one name, Yahweh. Yahweh. Don't have time to develop it this evening, but someday I want to get into a discussion with Adnan or someone uh, along the same lines. Why doesn't there seem to be any knowledge in the part of the Quran of the actual divine name of God in the Old and New Testaments. It doesn't seem like the author was aware of these things. Now, as you've seen this evening, we did it again, Adnan. We didn't manage to come to an absolute agreement on everything in one debate. Isn't that shocking? What are these opportunities? They are opportunities to require us to think, to hear from another perspective, to be challenged. But you see, as a Christian, I can trust the Spirit of God to work with the Word of God 
And that's why I continue doing these things. And I've said this before, and it is not in any way, shape, or form meant to be offensive. It is absolutely the honest truth. I pray for Adnan. I pray for Adnan. I, I pray for his, his happiness and his health. But this man knows, and every Muslim in this audience needs to know, my ultimate desire and prayer for anyone is that you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life. You know that's what I believe. I haven't hidden that from you. I know that he would love to have me say the Shahada and submit to Islam. I know what he wants. We can be honest about that without engaging in hatred toward one another. Because as a Christian, there is no room. There can be no room in my heart for hatred toward anyone. Jesus did not leave that room there. He takes it all up. I can't have hatred in there. And so I hope this evening you have been challenged, and I hope especially you recognize, if you come from the Islamic faith, my concern, my message, and my love for you. Thank you for being here this evening. God bless.